Welcome everyone and thank you so much for deciding to spend this time with us for the first CFS Roundtable of the year. My name is Paula Vega Tagle. I'm the Global Partnership Manager and Founding Partner at Circular Fashion Summit. And for those who are not familiar with the Lablaco ecosystem, at the core of what we do at Lablaco is helping brands and retailers to digitize and connect their products at any level of the value chain through Web3 technologies like blockchain and virtual reality. And aside of what we do at Lablaco, we also have the Circular Fashion Summit, which since 2019, we've been hosting uh, our global XR community, accelerating circular fashion through design, technology, and sustainability. So as part of, as the technology and sustainability conversation goes, today we'll be deep diving into the future of footwear manufacturing, touching upon the current state of trends within footwear design, while decoding also how brands like New Balance or On are revisiting their core values and setting innovative processes while creating products designed for longevity and also taking low impact materials into account. So I'm super happy to be joined in this conversation by Tanya Sahanga, which is a product uh, well, a product creation expert, and she's going to be the one leading the conversation. And we also have Marcus Glasser, the senior, senior vice president at EMEA at EOS, Katie O'Brien, the senior manager of footwear innovation at New Balance, and finally, Niels Altroge, the head of technology innovation at ON. So I'll let everyone introduce themselves, and then I'll let you, Tanya, please take it away. Yeah, um, sure, I'll start. Uh, my name is Tanya, as Paula mentioned, and uh, I'm here to moderate the conversation. I'm super excited about that. Uh, I have a background in uh, product innovation and creation, and I'm really excited to, um, to have a conversation with uh, everybody who's here specifically because we have a cross-section of the product creation uh, uh, chain uh, looking at the brands and the suppliers, and of course, questioning and looking at the future of manufacturing footwear and the technologies that are driving us. So, um, yeah, I will not talk too much more about myself and let uh, Marcus, then Niels and uh, Katie to introduce themselves, but um, maybe as a fun way to introduce each other. I would uh, like to ask you each, uh, as we are discussing this topic, the future of footwear manufacturing to pick one word which you say is representing that for you in your context, in your individual companies and expound on that word maybe in just a minute or two minutes to explain and give us a little bit of a practical understanding of how you are actually working towards this in your teams. So I think that would be a nice way for you to give um, the audience an idea of who you are. Okay, Tanya, thanks a lot. So I will get started. So yeah. what's the word from EOS? The word from EOS is responsible. Uh, why now responsible? Because I think we all are human beings and I think it's uh, our responsibility to take care of the planet, of the people, of the environment. And I think also we need to ensure that footwear will be manufactured under the aspect responsibility as well. And uh, Therefore, EOS is very much focusing the footwear and the consumer market and also working on the circularity uh, to make it possible until 2025, which is a critical date. Um, it means all you as a major brand, great value. Uh, so what we would like to do at EOS, we focus performance and individualism so that we have the customization part, uh, which we can also implement in the products, what you do. Uh, so that means also cooperation is key and uh, one last sentence is actually, of course, you as a footwear manufacturer, I just remember on the on side, you know, they are working with famous people like Roger Federer by introducing new stuff. And I think we can also help uh, and participate as a partner with our 3D printing solutions. I think this would be a big pleasure. And that's the word plus the sentences from EOS. Super. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Niels? Yes, um, um, Neil from, from on. Uh, and uh, the word uh, I would like to start with is basically uh, how we approach the topic of manufacturing. It's re slash evolution. So revolution meets evolution. And, and what that means is basically, hey, we have several drivers um, uh, we are hunting for. 
Uh, one of them is, of course, sustainability, bringing down the impact we have uh, on our planet. On the other hand, it's performance and bringing the fun uh, out to the runners um, by delivering high qualitative uh, products. And we think a good mixture, mixture of healthy evolution of manufacturing processes, which are already existing, but we still have a lot of potential to get improved with, with a good mixture of, of ways of manufacturing, which create something completely new and are completely unknown in the industry at the moment. So revolution meets evolution uh, in, in a good mixture um, could, could help us to reach that. Super, thanks Niels and Katie. Hi everyone, thanks Tanya for having me. Thanks Paula and Dan. Um, really excited to be here with Marcus and Niels today. Uh, my name is Katie O'Brien. I've been at New Balance for about eight years now. Uh, I drive our sustainable innovation portfolio. I think the first word that comes to mind for me is scale. Um, certainly within New Balance, within the sustainable innovation team, a lot of what we're working on is sort of these smaller ingredients that we're identifying to make big impact at scale. Knowing that, you know, there's a, definitely an opportunity to incubate and drive a lot of changes in smaller capsule collections, but we really believe that the biggest changes that we're making are, are across all of our footwear and apparel products. So um, super excited to, to be here today and, and talk more about that. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. Super, thanks. So uh, already from that, actually, we have a quite an interesting sentence, which is giving a picture, responsible revolutionary scale, something like this. And um, it's somehow, I think, already beginning to show a picture of some of the things that are happening in the footwear industry at large. And I, I think it's really cool that we have a new, bal new balance and on here because you guys are representing the sporting goods industry. What we know is a very competitive industry. My own background is also in Adidas, so I'm really familiar with this world. So what, what becomes interesting is what I mentioned also at the beginning with um, you know, sitting here, Marcus this cross-section because this is really a bit of an intersection what begins to happen in creation and we are all pushing for interesting things Marcus called out circularity um Niels called out sustainability and uh Katie you were touching on scaling and obviously I know you're working in sustainability innovation team and new balance my question uh, also a bit of a fun one to begin with you can answer me in, in any way you like. I'm just going to pose it. Sustainability or performance? Which one are you guys saying? So this is to New Balance and on. I'll start with Katie. I, I think it doesn't need to be or. I, I would love to see it be and. Um, I think the industry has set, set itself up in a way to put out performance standards that obviously continue to iterate and get better year over year. Um, what we really are targeting within the sustainable innovation team is performance without sacrificing sustainability and vice versa. And also the scale, when I, when I mentioned scale, um, my, impact, my, my, my view of that is that we need to make an impact at scale as it relates to sustainability. So we see a lot of you know, opportunities to drive sustainability in small sort of capsule collections to really highlight what the opportunity is, but we wanna then take that and, and really create that impact at scale. So how are we applying all the learnings that we have in these smaller iterations to the, the huge amount of product that we're, we're making today? Um, so yeah, performance and sustainability would be my answer. Nice. Niels, what are you saying? Yeah, I, I just can agree. So there shouldn't be a compromise and performance and sustainability should go hand in hand. And I mean, that's possible. I just want to give a, a quick example. Um, when you have a material, right, and you can source this from a pet petrol resource, um, from fossil resource, uh, or from bio resource, in the end, the material doesn't care where the sea atoms are coming from, right? Um, so you can reach amazing performance today with, with uh, materials like, for example, uh, uh, polyamides, uh, which are coming from bio resources like pea bags, for example, which have very, very high performance. Um, I mean, the world record was run in, in such a material, right? Um, and it, it's, 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 it's partly bio-based uh, and it is sustainable. So yeah, it should be definitely the goal to, to show and to, to prove that sustainability and performance are, are no opposites. It's, it's also an end from, from my side. 
Cool. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Marcus, can you share from your perspective, you are developing additive manufacturing, you are working on additive manufacturing technologies. Can you explain how you are approaching performance in the context of sporting goods industry since we have New Balance and on here, but also keeping in mind on the call, we have um, different cross sections of the footwear industry represented. So what is your additive manufacturing technology saying when it comes to performance? I mean, I just can uh, also confirm what Niels and also Casey said before. So it's not or, it's and, performance and sustainability. And if you take this under the perspective of us, the technology solution provider, then it's more to say, okay, we have a product and it will just say it, Niels, you know, it's a bio-based, it's either a P11 material yeah, and, or it's also a P-Bux material. But in general, it's also important that if we go in these material classes, we have also a called digital foam product. So it's a, it's a product where we can really have an, a guided uh, performance so that we have a direction, you know, how we want to print, a, let's say midsole, that you have the best value out of this, uh, of this properties. But also not only that, that we also can seg segment certain areas of the midsole, you know, with the different properties. Uh, I think that means you have then a kind of ability to change the comfort, the rebound, the cushing, the stability, the support. And this means, of course, we can do a lot in additive in the performance side, which is maybe at the moment still a bit untouched. But I think this is also our vision uh, to really enter here with these brands, uh, with, with New Balance or on, that we can really work on this. And of course, this material should be then sustainable that we can really afterwards bring it down to the earth and that we have this cradle to cradle effect. Okay. So Marcus, you're beginning to touch on how you can engineer zoned performance using your materials. Um, Niels, in on, I would say on from my perspective is really known for the bottom unit innovation and uh, what you came out with, uh, with the cloud uh, technologies and now all the other ranges and uh, footwear you have coming out and also apparel. So can you, comment to what Marcus has said and maybe talk a little bit about what are some of the materials or technologies you are developing, maybe focused on bottom unit, but if you want to expound, it's also okay. Oh, Tonana, as, you, as you said, right? Um, so when you look at the product of ON, we are very, very uh, famous for our so-called structural cushioning, right? We have a single element, uh, and we do not only cushion with a material, but also with a, a engineered geometry or structured uh, structure. And nevertheless, of course, the material one is a, is, a, is, a, is a factor where you can have the biggest impact, for example, on sustainability. And we have basically two, uh, two main goals, which are using as a tool to bring the impact in the future down. It's uh, first of all, moving away from fossil resources on, on the materials. Um, and on the other hand, um, becoming uh, circular. And what you have to do here, for example, for um, moving away from fossil resources is replacing current petrol-based material with biosynthetics. Another option is using advanced recycled materials. What I mean is with advanced is not materials who has to be downcycled, like for example, only mechanical recycled materials, when you grind um, a midsole and, and, and mix them in, in, in another one, you always lose a little bit of performance. And, and what are ways to keep this performance? Um, this is another interesting question. So biosynthetics, advanced recycled materials, and then um, maybe you, you have heard uh, our first or our newest ambition of um, using carbon emissions to make materials. So these are the different ways we are using on, 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 on material innovation to move away from fossil resources. And on the other hand, when we are talking about um, circularity, we all know the most of the running shoes of the world are made out of EVA. And it's, uh, it has its advantages, but it, unfortunately, it cannot really be recycled because it's not, it's not thermoplastic. So what kind of materials, but also manufacturing processes could, uh, could uh, there, there be so to make a um, recyclable uh, uh, midsole? And then we are looking into different kinds of ways of uh, creating a foam which is recyclable or creating a, um, a structured system. Uh, it don't have to be a foam, a material which feels like 
a, a great cushion system which follows the philosophy of on. Um, this is definitely what we are looking into it. So tuning recyclability through manufacturing. Really interesting points you're bringing up, Niels, and uh, thanks for sharing that insight. So uh, biosynthetics, advanced recycled materials and looking at different structures and tuning them to address recyclability, sorry, specifically to the midsole. Mm -hmm. um, that means to me, when I'm listening to you, you're also looking at uh, shaping different types of circularity by components. Mm -hmm. Is, if, am I understanding you correctly? You're looking at your circular approach by components. So the midsole should be circular in terms of EVA or shifting from EVA. Uh, or are you looking at this more holistically across not only footwear, but also other, other product? 100%. We have this, right? I, this was an example about our midsole. In the end, you have to look at it holistically, right? right? You have to find solutions for all materials. I mean, the easiest solution would be you're just using one material, right? Then you don't have uh, this problem. Nevertheless, you need to have uh, specific performance uh, requirements. Uh, so basically, what, for example, very general uh, helps is reducing the parts of, of a product, reducing the amount of materials of a product, and that counts for footwear and apparel. Um, it, it sounds very easy, but it, of course it is not. So uh, I, would, I would look at it more holistically. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. And I will just say uh, I'm a bit guilty of the easier solution, which you mentioned, yeah, the one material. <laughs> This is uh, some, some technologies I was also uh, helping to work on when I was back in Adidas, but for sure, there are multiple approaches to this. And I think this is, this is the good thing uh, that you are sharing some of the angles. Katie, from New Balance, uh, what, what is your approach towards material innovation, um, whether it's relating to circularity or, or something else? Yeah, I think, Tanya, if you don't mind, I just want to build on one of the things that Niels mentioned. Um, yeah. I think obviously there's the focus on the material side, which is a critical part of what we're, we're looking at here. But in terms of opportunities for reducing the impact of footwear moving forward, there's also a huge one just around the energy density of the manufacturing process. So specifically when we think about bottom units, um, when you look at the environmental impact of the manufacturing of those bottom units, there's also opportunity to reduce that, whether it's through you know, clean energy of powering those facilities or even looking at lower energy input um, manufacturing techniques that are either able to reduce the amount of waste that's created, that's kind of building on what Nils mentioned as well, um, or minimizing the amount of energy that's required in order to make the finished good. Okay, you started to touch on really interesting points. Do you wanna, or could you share a little bit about the work which you're doing in New Balance to address some of those, because I think you're beginning to talk about how to make sustainability tangible, measurable. What are some of the things which you're actually using to be able to not only go after it, but track how you, well you're doing and across your full value chain. So yeah, do you wanna share about how New Balance is going after that? Sure. Um, so I, I think consistent with many of the other companies in the industry, we have, um, we're in the process of lining up our strategy to meet science-based targets. Um, as part of that, like many others in the industry, we do all of our carbon data reporting in accordance with the carbon disclosure project. Um, within that, we also are conducting internal LCAs um, that are both on our lifestyle as well as our performance product. Um, and that's really a tool to just get better transparency and visibility into at the product level, what are the actual environmental impacts um, within our sort of like scope three, uh, category one, um, uh, environmental impact categories. Um, and with that, we really leverage that to come up with ingredients and strategies that we can utilize to minimize the impact of our product. Um, so we look at that both um, in accordance with materials as well as manufacturing energy. Um, there are a number of, and Nils, I'm sure you're familiar with these as well, a number of sort of shared factories throughout the industry. Um, so you go to one factory and it's housing, you know, 20, 30 plus different brands. So there's huge opportunity for brands to come together um, and really look to, for example, electrify some of the thermal heat operations um, and change those over to greener energy. 
Um, so that's some of the work that's being done that, that New Balance is a part of um, in terms of moving over our, our energy um, mix to rely more on cleaner energy and renewables. Um, and then on the materials themselves, definitely focusing on recycled and biofeedstocks um, to minimize our reliance on virgin petroleum ingredients. Um, and then definitely a, a huge nod to what has been done with Adi. Tanya, I know you're a big part of that and, and Nils, um, what On is doing in order to really bolster uh, more circular footwear solutions. Um, and certainly that's really getting after um, the ability to not only have, have producers be responsible for the product at end of life, but also start to tackle the challenge around creating recycled feedstocks that can be utilized in a way that's really powerful and isn't just sort of degrading and downcycling um, over and over. So yeah, big big nod to everybody who's who's looking to uh, to change that. And it's it's a big challenge, but it's great to see the industry really starting to revolutionize that. Mm -hmm. Well, you, Neil, did you want to mention something? Just just one thing, a very interesting uh, mention from you, Katie, is this this uh, way you say, hey, let's work together, right? Uh, Tanya, at the very beginning, you said it's a very competitive industry, but there were um, circular shoe summit in Boston uh, a few a few weeks ago, where, where several brands were there, and one big takeaway is, hey, in re with regard to circularity, we only succeed if we work together in a consortium approach, right? Because it is about scale. It is about um, uh, how can we make circularity also economically feasible? Uh, how can we push the performance and how can we create enough pressure on other industries which are working with us to go also in this direction? And here it's not that on is only doing one thing and the other brands are doing the other things. It's here it's really time to, to, to partner uh, in, in strong consortiums to push uh, in this direction. Great, thanks, thanks for uh, picking up on that point. Katie brought up so many great points uh, in that last part. And I think the point about collaboration is really critical. It raises uh, a really good question, like you said, Neil, and thanks for sharing the example of the summit, which you uh, were part of. Uh, competition versus collaboration or how, how to manage that balance. And I guess to pull Marcus back into the conversation, it would also be interesting to hear from your perspective, Marcus and EOS, how are you approaching this balance of collaboration and competition? Because I also believe AM and these kind of this kind of technology part of the value chain is is also extremely competitive. I think it's it's a very good question, Tanya. And I think from our perspective, you know, when you started, when we started with EOS many, many years ago, 30 years ago. We talked about materials, we talked about processes, we talked about mach machines or technology. But you know, that's not enough anymore. We need to talk about the entire value chain. That means we need to talk about an end-to-end -end solution for, in this case, footwear industry. That means we cannot do it alone. Yeah? We can produce now the processes, the material, the, the machines, but we need partners. Yeah? We need partners who take care about process processing, who take care about design, who take care about uh, software solutions. Yeah? And for instance, one example is there's the IM footwear project, what we are working on since two years together with Siemens, together with Dimension, which is a partner in our ecosystem, which are doing the smoothening and the coloring of, of, uh, of for instance, midsoles. And that actually works quite well that we really together with them develop an end-to-end -end solution for the footwear industry. Also uh, being able then afterwards, if you have done it, to enable and also certify an a partner network, so which can we call it end-to-end -end production partner network or contract manufacturer, which then can take over this industrial solution, what we developed together in this case with IM Footwear, and then can prepare and then we can produce then midsoles for uh, New Balance or on, for instance, in the in the good way and also in the in the best quality. And I think it actually, if you talk about competition, I think it's not a problem at all. I mean, the market is, in my opinion, big enough. Uh, we need to look in our case, we need to look on the IP. Uh, this is, of course, important. And of course, we have one strong benefit at the moment that we, I think we are leading in the topic sustainability uh, in terms of material development, in terms of how we approach the whole thing, in terms of energy consumption of the machine, uh, 
uh, material development, material production. So it's not solved, but we have a strong focus on that. Yeah? And I think then also the performance, what we can do in what I mentioned before with this digital foam product gives a really good ability to this market. Yeah? And I think this is actually collaboration is from the absolute key that we can make it. And I think I like very much what Casey said before, and I was thinking about it, yeah, because of course, if you scale, we talk about having more machines, having more uh, maybe requirements for energy. So, well, we can also indirectly also influence it by, you know, shaping industrial solution for having, let's say, more efficient energy solutions for electro engines, for production equipment, you know, that we also can really influence here the sustainability, not directly now on the on the footwear, but indirectly on how do we run a company, how do we run a factory. Uh, so this is also an important message what you gave cases, which you was thinking about how can we approach this in the future. Okay, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Marcus. So uh, for me, what I understood is you are in Eon, sorry, EOS looking to looking to encourage more of a vertical collaboration, right? And this, this I think, also is a form of consortium which brings out excellent product. And what Niels is also addressing is an interesting shift in the industry is looking at sort of this horizontal collaboration where people who are directly comp competing are also looking to say, how do we also form these safe places to collaborate and still somehow have our... Um, competitive edge and market share and all of that. And I think uh, as Niels, uh, Niels, I think you mentioned it, circularity is just the prime case for this because it absolutely is not a one player uh, wins all. This is just impossible. You cannot, um, you know, with, without including the consumer, without including an um, upstream and downstream uh, partners. But uh, because of time, we're kind of, uh, since we did start a little bit later, I want to unfortunately, uh, skip some of the uh, some of the uh, discussion which which had been brought up on circularity and hopefully we get time just at the end to touch back on it. I see already in the question there's some questions related, and I want to jump to looking at what are other drivers that are shifting or that you see are shifting the future of um, footwear manufacturing. So sustainability is is obvious, it's clear to us, and I think we can all agree as we've said it has to be tangible, it has to be transparent, it has to be measurable. Great idea shared there, but what else are you seeing in your space that is shifting the future of manufacturing? Um, Niels, maybe if you could go first. On the one hand, uh, novel performance, so generate a novel performance through manufacturing, and on the other hand, decentralized production, right? The moment the full production is in Asia, um, but what is if you produce much more near the market? And uh, a lot of players or a few players have already tried it uh, it, it never 100% made it. And, and the question is why? Uh, and, and here it's maybe about we, uh, you should not try to, to decentralize products which are made in a certain way since, since 40 years down there in Asia, but you need new manufacturing ways and you need new uh, ways of constructing a product to make it or design it for manufacturing and near the market. And this is definitely one, one very exciting um, area. Oh, interesting. Uh, I definitely will agree with that. And Katie, do you want to jump in straight, straight on? Sure. Yeah, I guess on the New Balance side, um, we have been able to manufacture domestically in the United States um, for about 100 years. I think that the fact that we have that history allows us, we have the supply chain set up, we have the factories here. Um, I think it would be, to Nils's point, very difficult to localize that supply chain now if we didn't already have that, that depth of, of doing that previously. Um, I do think the localization of supply chains and manufacturing is going to be something that's really critical, especially as we see the world continue to change and, and the challenges with um, kind of having the global, more of a globalized supply chain rather than just, um, you know, having it really biased to one region right now. Um, I think there's definitely opportunity for that, both in terms of giving the consumer what they want that's closer to trend, and then also just in terms of sustainability and localization of supply chains. Okay, picking up on your uh, localization uh, 
point, which which is which is an interesting one, and um, again, uh, really good insights from from both of you. Uh, one question I would have though is practicality. I think is something which is super important to to address, and economic practicality almost becomes the preeminent decision maker in almost all our business decisions, and um, which is the conflict with sustainability oftentimes. Um, do you see this uh, onshoring, uh, nearshoring, more of a public sentiment, uh, which has become sort of like undesirable publicly, but economically, it's really unlikely to happen? I mean, what, what is your sense? Because I, I will say I hear this topic a lot, especially the last two years, we have a stronger business case for it. But financially, the investment, you know, coming from all the relevant institutions, I still uh, would say there's a bit of a gap. How do you see it? Uh, maybe Neil, since you brought it up, and then Marcus, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts there too. Yeah, yeah no, no, I mean, this is uh, right, a, a little bit the elephant in the room regarding this topic. Um, I think it only works with drastic redesigning uh, of, of the products. So again, uh, I think it goes all over uh, DFM design for manufacturing here in, in this case and changing the way of, let's say, right, uh, of, of making a product and putting it together, changing it from 120 steps to three, extremely, extremely described. Or, um, and, and, and I think this is, is, is the only way uh, we can meet, uh, on the one hand, the vision of decentralized production and like an economical feasible one. So when we as, uh, not only work on the manufacturing side, but also then uh, adapt the product. Mm. Interesting perspective. Thank you for sharing, Marcus. Uh, quickly, how, how would you see it from an uh, additive manufacturing perspective? Reshoring or onshoring? I would, I would say it's, it's, you know, like, uh, and we touch this now, and, and you touch this very nicely now. So on the one hand side, we talk about decentral lies production this is key but it will also we need also to streamline the production chain so we need to really make sure that we have a high degree of automation because then only then we become the cost down for instance our laser perfusion machine which comes to the market soon there is around 10 times more productive than current technologies so this will by sure bring us down in costs uh, let's see how far this is also satisfying casey and yields but i think this is a very good step forward and it means also we need to really integrate automation uh, that we have, um, that we don't have any issues. Okay, we produce the part, we have the process processing, so we, there are a lot of steps in the process. And I think if we do that and we eliminate this, then we can get the cost down. We can really produce then the parts as required from the prop brands. But for us, it's also important that we, you know, that we really take the guidance of New Balance and on, for instance, how and what do we have to do to be successful in this application? And uh, we learned about the materials before, we learned about the sustainability, but it's, it's also about what we said before, performance is the customization, it's the cost part, but it's of course also scaling, uh, what, we, what we have to do. How can we scale up in a, in a good manner that you can produce a few million midsoles, uh, which is also not to forget, it's, it's also not done in one day. So this, we also have to work together and fulfill the requirements. But I feel also decentralized production is key. Uh, this we learned now the hard way during the last two years in the supply chain crisis. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Marcus. That was uh, quite a nice way to tidy up um, the last point. And uh, unfortunately, we kind of have to begin winding down our conversation, which I am finding uh, very interesting and I'm enjoying of course and I hope you all are as well including participants uh, for the sake of having some form of interaction with our audience let's use these last maybe three four minutes uh, Paula maybe if you could help me with the timekeeping there what we have uh, to get a question in um, I just pick it from the chat is that correct Paula Yes, so I think we have a couple of questions on the chat and if everybody is okay with that, we can extend it to maybe 10 minutes and then whoever needs to drop, just feel free, just because there's a lot of interaction also happening in the chat, so it would be a shame to, to miss out on those, so. Okay, so, uh, okay, 
if we say we have a few extra minutes, then let's do it. Um, I want to pick up on the topic that was touched on since we were just talking on shoring. Uh, okay, this one is just uh, lifting up Salomon as an example of uh, onshoring and success. Okay, let's move it on and uh, look to the topic of uh, how do you compare the performance of digital foam 3D uh, to regular foam? Do you have a better energy return versus weight balance? So that's a performance question for you, Marcus. Um, okay, this the digital form is competitive in performance. So this question, right? Exactly. Yes. So I mean, in, in principle, you know, what we what we need to see is that we have the directive approach with our digital foam product. Yeah, so that means we can really say, okay, how do we use this material? In which aspect? Yeah. Also, in which areas of a midsole that we have the highest performance uh, on the shoe, and also the highest performance, of course, for the clients. And this is actually, of course, if you compare with conventional foams, not the same, because if I take a shoe uh, in, in my whatever 46 size, uh, and uh, it's the same shoe as you were with maybe 39, uh, but I'm a very different weight class, then of course, how do you balance this out today? But of course, you can now in the future, we could, we could work and say, well, this digital foam for a, a heavy person like me in a, in a bigger size it has a different character has a different performance, has a different maybe pattern that, you know, it fits very well for me. And this is actually what you can achieve with additive manufacturing because we can influence this. And I think this is very, very much important yeah, because then you have, of course, the ability to influence rebounding, influences supporting and stabilizing. And this is actually, I would say, this is a very good, very good ability what we can offer and what the additive manufacturing industry can offer to the brands and the footwear market. But again, the guidance of Casey and Niels, you know, is this direction what we have to improve? What can we do differently? But we believe that's a big benefit what we can offer here. Okay, thanks, Marcus. So if I pick up on what you just shared, Marcus, and I am also going to paraphrase what uh, I think it's uh, Dieter Buten. I cannot see the rest name, the rest of the name. Dieter Buten Bender, exactly. Um, uh, let's see. So he is making a point about this zone performance of so this digital foam applied to on and new balance. Marcus, I think you already explained it. So if I ask another question, which might be relevant for Niels and Katie, what are some of the challenges that you would share openly and say, okay, this uh, technology still has challenges in this part and this part, you know? Sorry, is the question specific to sustainability? So it's, to Marcus, or it's, to, it's to Marcus to share to you and Niels, what are the challenges related to this digital foam or the zoned performance through additive manufacturing? I, I think certainly the data gathering element of it, like what is it that a specific runner or specific performance is required from that foam? Um, and how can you leverage data gathering on an individual to really match the type of midsole, for example, that they would require. Um, and, and then certainly the scalability of that. How can you do a one for one at scale? Good question. Uh, definitely good question. Uh, I think the rest of the points we have, there was one about circularity actually. Maybe I can touch on this one. Uh, I seem to have lost it. Oh ah, yeah, when does the finish when the finished good has been used, it may become waste unless it is recycled. Uh, no, this is a statement. Does the footwear industry believe in circularity by reusing recycling or by deep, uh, biodegradation of the products? I think I'll let you to answer it, uh, Katie. Yes, um, <laughs> I think that both are a really critical part and it's, it's gonna depend on what type of footwear you're going after. Um, certainly having recycled feedstocks is part of the part of the opportunity um, and really just diminishing the reliance on, on virgin petroleum. Um, as we look at end of life, obviously there is the opportunity to either reintegrate that back into um, a closed circular loop and utilize those ingredients, ideally back in a footwear to footwear operation or in apparel to apparel rather than downcycling. Um, there are some 
technical technical challenges with that, just in terms of actually achieving the same level of performance without degradation. Um, and then on the biological side, more in, more in that sort of loop, um, there's a bit of loss that goes along with making a product and then returning it to the earth. Um, if it biodegrades without harming the environment, obviously there's there's opportunity there, but then there's also the opportunity cost of the energy that was put into making that product. Um, so that's another thing to be considered. But yeah, I would say both are, are opportunities for circularity. Um, but I'll pass over to Nils if, if you have additional things to add there. And I mean, I 100% agree. Uh, it, it's both, a, it depends on the situation, right? On the goal you have, on the, uh, on the product you have. One, I think, um, let's say challenge on biodegradability is um, that, right? There are several ways. It can be compostable. It can only be the biodegradable. Uh, bio, biodegradable only works like in a certain conditions. So when biodegradability really works and there's a scaled up solution of really degraded degrade uh, materials, then it's a great or it, it's a, 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 a good solution. But uh, currently, um, let's say there, there the standards are not really really there and not everything. Uh, uh, where stands biodegradability stands on, you can throw on the compost, right? Um, so uh, I think this is why where circularity or re recyclable materials is a little bit further. There is starting to be a supply chain of um, getting creating back loops, getting material bags, recycle them, keeping the value and, and making new stuff out of it um yeah this is just to add yeah okay uh we don't have any more questions from the chat a few uh statements advanced biocircular love it and uh lots of uh and some other comments uh supporting the work which you are doing in on and in new balance i would like to just take that chance to use the last two minutes we have to pose a question since we have um an additive manufacturing specialist or supplier here um, what and Katie touched on scale. Uh, of course, we know that injection molding and other forms of technology are really more standard. And uh, Katie talked about it in relation to EVA. I, I think it was Katie who mentioned that, um, or Niels actually mentioned that rather. Uh, my question to you, Marcus, and maybe this will be the closing point if you can just shortly tell us what are some of the barriers to scaling additive manufacturing that you see, because um, despite all of the potential and the promise that it's holding. I mean, I think if you look now today on additive manufacturing, um, there are a lot of abilities, uh, as you know, also for footwear. But of course, number one is that we get solved this topic cost down. I think this is also important because also in this approach, what, what you have now at, at New Balance or on, I think costs are still, of course, very important. It means we need to really work on automation. We need to really work on other products. And we need to get it right in terms of reliable quality because we talk here about mass production. Uh, we need to really make mass production products with a low waste rate in terms of, let's say, scrapped uh, midsoles in production. And of course, we, so that means we need to really achieve that we have a reliable technology uh, for mass production and think in, in a very good way. But of course, there's still something to do, fully automized, fully digitized. Then we have the right materials, uh, which are also sustainable. I mean, we have talked about PPEX, we talked about the bio-based polyamide 11, which we have, but still we need to scale it up now. But I mean, these are not so big steps. You know, it's, it's we are very close. And I think if we would achieve now in footwear, which is a really great market and big market, a really breakthrough, it could really turn around the entire additive manufacturing consumer world, because this is actually I believe there's a big market and I think this is a big chance for us and therefore we're very much keen here at EOS to work with these brands because we can learn from you but this is actually what I see what we have to do uh, to make sure that this technology and also additive manufacturing as an industry becomes even more successful as it has developed over the last 30 years. Great thank you Marcus. Then uh, Katie and Niels, uh, Marcus had a great uh, opportunity to share scale challenges, I'd like to ask you, maybe just take 30 seconds, parting words, uh, what would you like the audience to know about on or what are your thoughts on what we've discussed so far and new balance respectively? 
Sure, um, I, I'll go first. So first off, thanks for taking this opportunity. Always great to connect. And I think the more we have these conversations, the more the more progress that we make. Um, I think fundamentally the message that I would always like to get out there is that it's an opportunity for us to do better um, as, a, as an industry at, at large. Um, and if that means kind of coming together in a pre-competitive space to create progress towards minimizing the impact of footwear and apparel on the planet, um, I, I think that that's something that we really need to do. So uh, passionate about doing that and, and engaging with suppliers and, and vendors such as EOS that are looking to kind of collaborate with brands like On and New Balance in order to move those, those opportunities forward. Super. And Niels? And, and definitely uh, to, to, to add on this, um, we cannot only tackle one specific part. It's not only about manufacturing, right? It's not only about product design. It's not only about supply chain as all of that. So it basically needs a joint effort of um, different experts, uh, different companies, uh, different industries um, to, to basically make really here a change and, and change the impact we have uh, on, on, on our planet. And I think um, we call it that on the survivor spirit, right? So how can we create products to, to ensure that we all will survive? And uh, of course, that we can enjoy um, our planet um, and have fun while running. Super, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if I share your one thing words at the beginning, responsible revolutions or revolutionary scale, I would add mine, which is summing up what we've discussed, collaboration. So thank you so much. I think that we have plenty of work to do and uh, I'm glad to see and I'm ha happy to see where this industry will take it. Uh, so Paula, I hand back to you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for this super enlightening conversation. I think I also love the fact that everybody was engaging on the chat and posting questions and also just sharing also your, your knowledge over there. And I think going back to the starting point of how we ended up uh, having this open opportunity to discuss about uh, opportunities within circularity, I think this is just emphasizing of how it cannot exist without collaboration. So we really hope that this conversation can ignite some, some further collaborative action with everybody present today, also from the speakers, but also from the guests that are here and join and decided to spend their time together with us. So yeah, be look on the lookout for our newsletter where you will receive the highlights of this conversation. And also if you follow us on LinkedIn at Circular Fashion Summit by Lavlaco, you'll get to see any further conversations and also our coming round tables and finally the summit that is happening this November. So as I know that we have a lot of people also from the industry joining, I'll just encourage you to follow up on any ideas also to collaborate and you can just write at paula.lavlaco.com or just follow us on our channels and also write also to the speakers and everybody that made this conversation possible. So thank you so much everyone for the time and I hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>